Well, good morning. This is Ms. Dagenford, and we are today going to be looking at the second question of animal behavior. How does this animal's experience during growth and development influence the response? Uh, the other day we looked at what are the signals that immediately provoke it. So we're getting a little bit broader and looking at how this changes. So let's first take a look at innate behavior. And innate behavior is behavior which is genetically fixed. And one way to examine whether or not a behavior is genetically fixed is to see what happens if you um, breed hybrids. And they have done this uh, with birds. These little lovebirds, there's a peach face lovebird, and the peach face lovebird, they tuck the straw to build their nest in their rump feathers. They'll turn their head, uh, you can see right here, they'll turn their head to tuck the straw in the back uh, of their rump uh, and then fly off to their nest. The fishers love bird, um, as well as most birds, they just carry it off in their beak. If you breed these two, you'll have a hybrid that will um, turn around, but they won't actually tuck the straw in their rump. They just do this little genetic based behavior where they turn their head, um, but then they keep their straw in their beak. Uh, and in fact, this persists through generations, uh, just the head turning. Uh, most of the innate behavior is adaptive. It's very important for survival. Think about it this way. Learning is not an option. You have one chance. We have very simple nervous systems or a simple nerve pathway. You might see, uh, for instance, um, a receptor that's hearing something or smelling something uh, that gets sent down one nerve. And then that nerve synapses with another nerve and that neuron might then connect to muscles or uh, it might be a little bit more elaborate. It might go to a part of the brain, but we have a receptor. It, it synapses or connects and then it will uh, turn around and go to muscles. So these can be very simple systems. A good example of an innate, these are, uh, and these are very, like I said, very important for survival, important for social systems. A good example of these uh, very simple behaviors, here is a fawn. Uh, a very, very be a young baby deer, and when they are that young, their instinct is to flatten themselves uh, or, or curl up as tight as possible against the earth. You'll, you see its head is against the ground, and um, they freeze. And in fact, uh, their heart rate will lower, their breathing will lower, and they just become extremely still. Uh, and this is extreme, this is very successful for hiding. They have very little scent and people can walk right by them in their yard, not realizing that the baby is there. And and this is what the deer are supposed to do. The mother deer uh, leaves the baby alone so uh, the baby can hide successfully and then the mother deer will come back to feed it, take care of it, and then it'll leave it alone again. Very, very proper, that's exactly what should happen, but there's a good example of a protective, a very uh, basic uh, behavior, very instinctive. But then we get a little bit more uh, complicated. We have learning, and learning are behaviors that are guided through experience. So something happens, and then something changes within the brain to, to remember, this is what I do. One of the simplest examples is imprinting, where you have a very strong association that's learned during a specific developmental period. And this is called the sensitive period or critical period. Uh, one of the best examples that most people know about are the baby geese. 
we will be looking at an example of how we've come to understand imprinting in helping an endangered species. But a lot of birds have this sensitive period where they learn um, who their mother is. And that actually will help them later on in life because they then understand uh, who they should look for when they're trying to find a mate. Uh, so birds that don't imprint well will have trouble later on because they will not know who to court. Uh, and then that learning is oftentimes then the releaser for the behavior. I'm going to follow mom. I'm going to go where she goes. Another example of a simple behavior, learned behavior, is habituation. And habituation is actually the loss of responsiveness. Um, think about a baby bird in the nest might respond to every little movement or every shadow because it might be thinking it's a predator or maybe it's thinking mom's come back. Well, then they, they start to learn, well, no, that's not a predator. That's just the shadow of the branch. And so they're not going to respond to that. Uh, one of the more humorous uh, examples, and you can see here in the picture of a really cute puppy in front of a mirror. And we, we adore these videos online. They're viral, these viral videos where the, the puppies and kittens, they just chase after everything. And the puppies growl at bananas or their image in the in the mirror um, and they eventually lose that they they kind of learn okay well that's nothing that's not another dog uh, and and I'm not going to play with them where the kitten realizes eh, that's not really fun to play with uh, now in the wild a, a good example of this would be vervet monkey uh, they've done studies where the baby monkeys will set off these alarm cries but when they're that young they don't know what truly is a threat so they can do really clear observations of these vervet monkeys these babies just crying and everything and and you remember the story of the boy who cried wolf well uh, the vervet monkey babies will learn that the adults aren't responding to them. You know, hey, there's a bird over there. And the adult monkeys understand that that's a harmless bird. It does, it's not going to hurt them. And so the young monkey will eventually learn, oh, okay, they don't respond to this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that anymore. Uh, spatial learning, they, they have done a lot of studies with spatial learning with insects, with, with uh, birds, even with rodents, where they examine how animals learn to find things in their environment. These digger wasps are uh, a very classic uh, experiment where uh, the scientist was examining how the wasp would understand to go back to her nest. And so they were interested in trying to determine how the wasp understood the environment. So they first looked at the objects around the nest. And so they took these pine cones and put them in a circle. And uh, for a few uh, uh, weeks, and then what they did is then changed where the pine cones were. And lo and behold, the wasp went to the circle. Uh, and so they very clearly were able to see that the wasp was using visual clues. Now, what was the clue? Was the clue the pine cone? Or was the clue the circle shape? The pine cones are in a circle. Well, why don't you uh, ponder for a couple of seconds to think about how you might test this? And maybe you come to the realization that you could set up a scenario where you have a triangle of pine cones or a circle of rocks. And so you're creating a, a, an experiment between those two variables. And lo and behold, he found that the wasp was looking at the circle. Uh, and a lot of animals use landmarks. And then they also use things like cognitive maps. Now, cognitive maps, there has been since a, a bit of a, um, it's a very complicated idea. It's not quite as easy as just a mental map. 
but that's a good way to get you started thinking about it where an animal can look at landmarks and between the spatial relationship of those landmarks understand okay I buried my nuts my my little acorns I buried them halfway between the rock and the stump and so they're able to kind of create a mental map now they've done some research and it's not quite as uh, simple as that but that's a good there is still some evidence that uh, animals use some sort of uh, mental map. Then we get to uh, associative learning. In associative learning, we have classical conditioning. And classical conditioning is where we have an, uh, an arbitrary stimulus with a reward or a punishment. Pavlov's dog is the easiest example of this. Before conditioning, you have an unconditioned stimulus, food, with an unconditioned response. In other words, this is natural. The, the dog salivates when he sees food. But then you have a neutral stimulus. And notice before the conditioning, when you blow the whistle, there's no salivation. Uh, and then you combine the two in what's called conditioning. And in conditioning, you combine the, the stimulus uh, with the food. Uh, and eventually, the dog associates the whistle with that food and we have then the condition response now in classical condition there's really no benefit from the animal for associating the condition stimulus in other words the dog is not really receiving a benefit from associating the whistle with the food that's just what happens now you've seen um maybe you have a pet dog or cat when you open the cat food can or the dog food treat or the dog treats you know that your dog or your cat responds well that's a, a excellent example of uh, of classical conditioning with operant conditioning uh, there is a clear association of the uh, behavior with a reward or punishment uh, a famous scientist that used uh, operant conditioning Skinner he created these Skinner boxes where the pigeon or the rat if they pressed the lever they would get food and they realized I'm associating this behavior stepping on the lever with um, with getting food now um, we do this all the time in training cats training dogs uh, but in the wild it also happens dogs and animals learn to avoid porcupines here's an unfortunate example um, and then poison dart frogs animals learn to avoid poison dart frogs uh, because of the bitter taste here's a humorous example of, uh, of a cartoon gotta love that one where uh, nature says do not touch <laughs> and then we and then a blue jay with a monarch butterfly we're going to be looking at an example there uh, in class uh, where the monarch butterfly tastes bad and then the blue jay will actually have to spit that back up and then what we do is we combine all of these to train so uh, sometimes uh, some some of you may have seen the click uh, training where you have a clicker and the dog associates the sound of the clicker with the uh, with a person saying sit and and those would be classical but then when they sit and they get the reward then they get the presentation of the treat and they associate up oh, there we go that's the operant conditioning and we'll be practicing those uh, tomorrow in class and then eventually we'll be looking at a, a higher level called cognition well hope this helps and we'll be talking about this tomorrow in class thank you